Hello, welcome everybody. We are really excited to have you all uh, participate of this webinar series today. Uh, my name is Amaya Tucha and I'm a professor in the Department of Horticulture at UW-Madison and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, we want to welcome you to the Alternative Berry Production Systems webinar series hosted by UW-Madison and the University of Minnesota Extension. Today we will be discussing current production in, uh, up in the Upper Midwest with Eric Wolski and Chris McGuire. We're going to be our speakers. And before uh, I introduce the speakers, I would just like to remind everybody that is attended to please um, mute yourself and have your camera off. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to either uh, put them in the chat or in the queue and answer um, feature that we have here in Zoom. And we will probably answer most of those questions at the very end. And with that, I just am going to introduce um, Eric and Chris. So Eric Wolski is a PhD candidate in the Department of Crop Science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He is, uh, his current research focus on rapid monitoring of shrub crops using drone. His other research includes current variety performance in the Midwest and the effects of shade on black current physiology and fruit biochemistry. Eric's goal is to help overcome the challenges in perennial crop production and increasing landscape diversity. And Chris, Chris McGuire has operated two onion farms in Belmont, Wisconsin with his wife, Julie, since 2003. They raise organic apples, currants, and gooseberries for sale through a community supported agriculture program at farmers market and to the local grocery stores. I also want to remind everybody that um, we will be recording this webinar and we'll put the, the links in the chat so that uh, you can go back and watch it or share it if you want with others that might be interested. And with that, uh, thank you so much to Chris and Eric. We're really excited to learn about currents today. And so I will just let you take it over from here. Okay, yeah, thank you, Amaya. So I'm going to try to share my screen. You see that? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for having us. We're excited to to talk about currants. It's definitely um, a crop with a lot of potential in this region. I think it's really you know, really hardy and well adapted. Um, I think you know some big barriers, uh, marketing particularly, and and some production challenges to be worked out. But there's a lot of potential, and so we're happy to to talk about it. Um, we're just going to kind of go through the whole range of production issues from, you know, fertility, variety selection, um, some trellising and training, harvesting, pests, and, and a little bit of marketing as well. Um, so I guess I'm going to start off with a quick intro about myself and our farm, and then Eric will take over from there. Oh, here I am. So yeah, my wife, Yuli, and I uh, started our farm back in 2003. We're in far southwest Wisconsin, um, in between Madison and Dubuque. Um, the, all of, uh, the entire farm is certified organic. Uh, we actually started growing vegetables, which is why we have that inappropriate farm name now. Um, but over the years, we transitioned to fruit. So currently, we have a bit over two acres of apples, which is what you see in this picture. And then another half acre of currants and gooseberries. And we also raise um, bedding plant seedlings in our greenhouse for sale. Uh, as far as currants specifically, uh, we started about 10 years ago with some smaller trial plantings um, and didn't want to scale it up at all for a long time for a few reasons, but primarily because we were intimidated by the really labor intensive harvesting process. Um, well, then uh, two years ago, we decided to take the plunge and put in a somewhat bigger planting. Um, it's, it's actually a quarter acre, not a half acre. That's a typo in the slide. Um, but we have a quarter acre of currants now. Half of it is trellised and half on trellis, which I'll talk about later. And we're really raising them for primarily fresh market, although selling to um, some smaller processors as well. And then, yeah, let Eric introduce himself. 
All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Wolski. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Illinois. Um, my main research so far has just been on currents and various ways of growing them. And my PhD in particular, I've been using drones to, to actually look at the look at the plants and to measure them. So it's been very exciting research that um, hopefully I'll be done with in the next month or so. Uh, next slide. Sorry. <laughs> well, picture didn't like it. There, oh, there it goes. Okay. A nice, beautiful current variety trial. This is in uh, Urbana, Illinois. We have another trial up in Stoughton, Wisconsin, um, but that site I will not be reporting on today. But here's the current trial. We also shaded half the rows, as you can see with the shade netting. Uh, it was mainly just to see how well they could perform in, say, uh, understore environments that you might find in agroforestry um, and potentially even something like agrivoltaics. So next slide. And I just want to start off with the beautiful color that you get between all the different types of currents. Here you can see uh, white currents or that ni nice clear color um, with sort of that lighter red, pinkish red is the red currents and that nice dark red purple color, those are the black currents. Next slide. So to grow currents, uh, the biggest thing is, you know, obviously is fertility. Uh, currants are a pretty heavy feeder. For the black currants in particular, we fertilize at uh, about 100 pounds nitrogen per acre. Uh, they prefer uh, like a slow release com um, compost or some organic uh, fertilizers, but they do quite well also with urea um, and a split plot application. Uh, and if you're doing that, it's really good to do it in springtime, usually around April uh, after, you know, the beginning stages of leaf out. And then again, in early summer, once they've completed their leaf out. Next. And I think Chris will back me up on this. The biggest concern with growing currants is weed control. Um, for them, for the most part, they have a really hard time competing with the weeds. They're a fairly shallow rooted shrub. And so particularly grass species do a really fine job of stealing all the nutrients and water in that rooting zone. And so here, this was a picture that was sent to me. Of, these are aronia bushes, but similar uh, physiology from Bob Johnson of Nectar Flow Farms in Indiana. Uh, these are the same cultivars planted at the same time of aronia, but the one side is a six foot weed mat and the other side is a four foot weed mat. And you can see just by, you know, keeping those weeds out from that drip line of the canopy, you get way larger plants uh, in production. So um, I think it's just a good sign. Herbicides can be used. Mechanical cultivation is an option. Um, we've done stirrup hoeing, but uh, the, those shallow roots do start getting in the way. Um, so weed mats, mulching, there's plenty of options there for weed control. And just a quick little thing. I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritties of, of my research, but um, this is just a kind of a list of some of the varieties and the yields uh, and yield patterns over the past couple of years. Um, as you can see, there's quite a bit of variation between one year to the other. Uh, for example, um, the variety black comb did not perform quite as well in 2020, but by 2021, it was our top yielding cultivar. Um, and you can also see that's the I didn't really color it correctly, but the orange is the black currants, the blue is the red currants, and the one recommended white currant variety I have is, is the white imperial. So with that, Chris. Yeah, thanks. So um, as I kind of said at the beginning, we've been doing a trial the last couple of years on trellising versus not trellising some of our currants. So I'm going to kind of go into some of those techniques in a little bit of detail. Um, the, Traditional way, certainly in this country, that I think most currants are being grown now is as freestanding bushes, so without any trellis at all. Um, and this is you know, pretty simple. You're just aiming to have kind of a mix of, of canes in that bush of different ages, like one, two, and three-year-old canes, and maintaining that with you know, pruning every winter. Um, basically, as the canes age out past about three years, they start to get less productive, and so you want to get those out of there and, and being continuously replaced by younger canes. Uh, and this is you know, a pretty low cost, simple way of growing the plants. You don't have to build a trellis. I don't have to do a, much in the way of training and managing. 
And the, but the big disadvantages here is that you get a really dense canopy, like you can see in this picture, and that slows down harvest tremendously. You got to wade through all that foliage to find the berries. Um, you tend to get a lot of kind of small to medium sized berries, which again, you're, you're kind of slowing down the harvest and it takes a long time to pick a given volume. Um, and then there's possibly also some reduced issues or some issues with increased disease because of reduced air circulation in that dense canopy. So um, an alternative that isn't used a lot in this country, but as far as I know, is really common um, in, in Northern Europe where they're, when they're growing currants for fresh market is to train them on a trellis using this cordon trellis method. Um, so, the, the, so the goal here is to keep a really narrow linear canopy um, and you know, improve air circulation, have sort of fewer but larger fruit that are really easy to pick. And the, the, the heart of the training system is that you have a few permanent, permanent vertical stems, which are called the cordons on each plant. And those are trained to be upright on the trellis. And then you have short horizontal branches off of the cordons that are actually producing the fruit. Um, and you're kind of fighting against the plant's natural tendency to throw up a lot of canes or suckers from the base of the plant um, and you know, eliminating all, all those new shoots originating from the ground. But as you can see in the picture on this slide, you know, you just have the, the few permanent plants and anything else that pops up from the crown of the plant, you're pruning out um, as they come up during the summer. And there's two different actual pruning techniques that can go along with this cordon trellis. And I've seen some people talk about both of them in this country, so I'm gonna describe them both. Um, I can't say we really have a good understanding of like which one is better or you know, are there some varieties that are better suited to, to one technique or the other. I don't think we've really developed that, that knowledge yet in, in this country, certainly. Um, but the first technique is what they call the Dutch method. And that's what's on this slide in these schematics. So the picture on the left shows a plant at the beginning of the growing season. You've got the permanent vertical cordon, that's the black stem there, with a few um, sort of short medium length branches that grew the previous season. And then later on in the summer, those branches from last year are now producing fruit. And then you're also growing some new shoots, uh, some current year's growth. And then after harvest, when you pick the berries off of last year's branches, you immediately come through and cut them off. So they're gone. And then you're just left with the branches that grew this current year. And then next year, those will be the fruiting branches. And this cycle goes on and on. Um, so a given branch only is there for two years. It grows one year, fruits the next year, and then it's cut off. The alternative is this English technique. So here you're starting out the season with more branches, but um, very short ones, kind of like spur type branches. And those will all bear a small, modest number of, of fruit clusters of strigs. And you'll get some elongated shoot growth from each spur. Um, after harvest, you don't do any pruning. Um, instead, you come back in the winter and you shorten back those spurs um, to a, you know, a few inches long. And then again, next year, you'll get a few clusters off of each of them. And again, next winter, you'll prune them back. So those are kind of permanent or semi-permanent branches, uh, but they're just being continuously shortened every year to keep them you know, short and manageable. I actually have a picture of the English technique. I don't have any personal experience with this, this method, um, but this is uh, Jason Fishbach's trial. He's in extension up in far northern Wisconsin. And this is like taken in March, you know, late dormant season. And he just went through and pruned these plants. And you can see they've got some, you know, really short branches that have just been cut back. And that's where the fruit will be produced this coming year. So um, we've established this trial on our farm. Um, we have, you know, basically plots that are half, half of them are trellised, half of them are freestanding bushes. And we got some grant funding to measure the time that each of these methods take, the material costs that we're incurring, and then the yields from each of them. Um, so we've got four current varieties here that are kind of fairly mainstay ones. Um, pink champagne, the, a pink one, Blanca's a white, 
and Rovada and Yankir von Tetz are both red currents. So this is a picture here. You've got a trellis plot on the right and a freestanding bush one on the left. Um, the, we read a description um, of the way they're doing this in Europe and kind of sort of try to copy their spacing and their trellising techniques. Um, so we're doing three feet apart between the plants and the bush plots and then a foot and a half between plants and the trellis plots. And that's just copied from what we read they do in the Netherlands. Uh, we got rows that are 10 feet apart. Um, and then there's a landscape fabric strip along, the, along each row, kind of like what Eric showed in those aronia bushes earlier. Um, we have drip irrigation. And we're using that Dutch pruning technique. So where you have a few long branches that fruit and then are pruned off uh, right after fruiting. A quick overview of the actual trellis. So we're using metal stakes um, with a, a top wire and a bottom wire. And then we suspended bamboo stakes in between the, the top and bottom wires. So I actually have a picture of it out in the field here. Um, so you can see all those bamboo stakes. Um, and then, so there's actually three bamboo stakes for each current plant. So you're aiming to have like a three liter kind of current. So it's three cordons growing out of each current plant. And one of those cordons is being trained to, eat, to uh, each of the three bamboo stakes. And this, you can kind of see in this picture, this was you know, right at bud break in spring. And there's a bunch of leafy green growth at the bottom of the plants. Um, you know, that'll, or the very base coming out of the crown, that'll be pruned off, you know, very soon. Um, but again, you're kind of fighting against the current's natural growth habit when you do this. It always wants to be sending up suckers from the base. That's how it, it wants to grow. Just for an alternative idea of, of trellising, this is again from Jason Fishbach's trial. It's actually inside a, a high tunnel, um, but um, you can kind of make out this is sort of a, a little more low budget trellis. You've got T posts, um, and then the actual set of bamboo stakes. He's using willow shoots, which I think he just harvested locally off, you know, the fence rows in his farm. And he's using that to train the cordons too. So in our trial, um, we obtained all of our, or most of our plants as plugs. Um, so this is kind of similar to how you might get. Um, some strawberries or, or brambles nowadays, you know, they're coming with a small root ball um, and you're getting a very short plant. Um, in the past, we'd always planted currants from bare roots so a larger bare root planting stock. Um, and I'm just mentioning this because the plugs have performed pretty poorly. So I'm not sure I would go this route again. Um, they've just been really slow to get established and start growing. Um, the picture on the left shows a plug plant after it was outside for a whole year. And currants are pretty vigorous growers in general, in my experience. So that's a really disappointing amount of growth for one season or for a current plant. Um, the, you know, the one on the right was actually a bare root plant. Um, and you can see it's got you know, 10, 20 times the amount of, of plant material there at the end of one season as the plug plant. Um, and consequently, we didn't normally you would harvest currants um, starting in the second growing season, or we always have. Um, but in this trial, we felt like we couldn't because all these plug plants were still tiny in the second year. So we actually defruited them. We haven't picked anything yet. And we're just going to start picking in the third season. Um, and I, but I do have some data here from the first two years, sort of from the establishment phase, just to give you an idea of what's involved. Um, it was freestanding bushes planted three feet apart. Um, costing about $9,000 an acre to establish. And most of that cost was for the plants themselves. That's the green um, portion of the, the bar there. In the trellis plots, the cost was over 25,000 an acre. Um, so the plants are planted at twice the density. So consequently, you're incurring twice the cost for the actual plants. And then the trellis material you know, adds that $8,000 or so in all the stakes, the wire, the bamboo, et cetera. So it's a pretty big additional upfront investment to go with the trellising. It's going to have to produce some pretty significant advantages down the road to, to make that up. Um, and in addition, there's extra labor in the trellis plantings, um, primarily just in the process of um, 
tying and staking those cordons and pruning off extra growth in the first couple of years. Um, so in the trellis, we are spending almost 700 hours per acre, whereas in the on trellis, it was you know a little more than half of that, you know, 350 to 375. Um, and then this is uh, you know, data from Jason Fishbach's trial. And so again, he's up in far, far northern Wisconsin, right near Lake Superior. He was actually growing the currents in an unheated high tunnel, which is something they do in the Netherlands as well, just for improved growth and earlier maturity, I believe. Now, and I'm just presenting this here as kind of, I don't have all the details of what, he, what he's done, but he shared some of the information with me just as kind of a counterpoint. Um, he was using all bare root planting stocks and it got a lot better growth. Um, and both his trellis and on trellis got the same spacing, 18 inches apart. Um, and in the year two, he started picking from these plants. And in the first year, in that second year of the planting, but the first year of harvest, he had much higher yields in the on trellis plots. Um, about four pounds per row foot versus two pounds in the trellis. Um, but in the, um, in the second year, the trellis kind of caught up and surpassed the bush plantings. Um, and then that's as far as he's gotten so far. And we'll see how it, it works out in the future. It, I think the bush, the bush plants kind of deploy a lot of stems really quickly. Um, the trellis plants are kind of restricted in the amount of stem they can put out in the first couple of years because you're cutting off a lot of new shoots. So they take a while to, I think, reach their full size and, um, and full yields consequently. He also had a picture that he sent me. Um, the strings on the left are currants that he picked from the trellised um, plants inside the high tunnel. Um, those are pretty nice, I'd say, well-developed strings with large berries. Um, they'd be pretty easy to pick in the sense that when you pick currants, you're picking one of these strings, one of these clusters at a time, usually if you're doing hand harvesting. So the more berries there are in a single string, the faster you're able to get the picking done, essentially. Uh, the ones on the right, those, those sort of puny ones, were from on trellis, you know, bush currants grown outside. So this picture is kind of confounding trellising versus on trellising with high tunnel versus outside grown. Um, but it does give you an idea. I mean, those, you have to fill pine containers with strings like the ones on the right. It takes you a lot longer um, than with ones like those on the left. And that's a really, really, really key issue in growing currants is that harvest time um, for picking the berries. So I think we're gonna switch over to some pest issues that you can encounter. And Eric's gonna go first here. Yeah, so um, yeah, after growing currants for the past, uh, well, six or so years now, um, I've encountered plenty of pests, but for the most part, compared to something like grapes or apples, currants are relatively pest-free, I would, I would argue. Um, one of the biggest concerns that we find in the black currants, red currants, and white currants are is the American gooseberry powdery mildew. Um, and so you here you can see it on the left in a pretty severe case on um, some sort of red current there, you can see the tips have just been completely um, taken over and grown over by the, by the uh, powdery mildew. And in an extreme case, this hasn't happened too often, but occasionally we do find uh, the, the powdery mildew actually jumping on and over to the fruit even. Um, this has only been seen mainly in uh, some of the real thin fleshed white currants, but that's a, that's a major concern, whereas when it's just the tips, it just kind of stunts growth and uh, limits overall uh, stem extension. But, you know, for the most part, you can still get good harvestable yields. But yeah, major issues when it starts jumping to the fruit. Uh, one of the main ways that we control is using horticultural oil in the spring. And then uh, once the temperatures start getting pretty hot in around June or July, we'll switch over to using Millstop, uh, which is a potassium bicarbonate. Uh, both of those are uh, can be found as organic options, and they do both do pretty well. But um, variety selection is arguably the best way to not get powdery mildew in your field. Also, I guess one quick note too is that um, in our shade trials, we do notice that the powdery mildew is uh, much more prevalent in the shaded rows, um, probably most likely due to the um, uh, 
reduce light penetration, reduce airflow into the canopies. So that's one thing to keep in mind, particularly if you're planting in um, less ideal locations. Next disease. Sorry, I lost my focus. There you go. <laughs> Oh, uh, go back one more, I think. Oh, no, sorry, never mind. Okay, current cane dieback is a rather um, arguably new disease in the, in the world of currents. It was uh, becoming evident in uh, the early 1900s before the current ban occurred. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of um, talk among the current growers, especially out east, about this disease. And then the currents all got banned. And so the disease kind of uh, disappeared from our, from our view. And uh, it has recently become a, a, a major issue. It took a while for us to identify even what was causing the death in some of our current plants. Um, and here you can see in the far left picture, uh, the, the little black sporing structures uh, that, that appear uh, typically uh, towards the tips of the current shoots. Um, they, they occur on dead wood already, but the big issue is when it starts to occur on the, on the living tissue. And you can see here in the middle what that inside of that stem all rotted out looks like, which is a clear evidence sign of it. And on the right there is, is the necrosis you see on individual canes. And so um, the advantage is that it doesn't necessarily take over the whole plant. Uh, the disadvantage is that it's still pretty prevalent and it will take out entire canes. And as of right now, we're still working through what the potential uh, control options are in terms of chemical controls, but mechanical controls work well. Um, going through and pruning out the, um, the dieback when you see it has been very helpful and helps reduce the disease load and just making sure that you're sterilizing your pruners in between each cut. And white pine blister rust is obviously the, probably the most common disease you, you, you hear floated around with currents. This is the reason why currents were banned for most of the last century. Uh, this disease, it spreads from the currents where it just defoliates the currents. The currents can live with the disease, but it can spread to the white pine family of trees, uh, which especially in the early 1900s was a major logging uh, timber crop. And so it was a major concern. Uh, the currents got banned. The disease really didn't go away uh, because we have just so many wild native currents that also carry this disease. And so in the 1960s, they lifted the ban and currents have been allowed to grow since then. Uh, it's still a concern, but many of the white pine plantations uh, are using proper uh, management of their forests, of their, of their silviculture. And the currents themselves for the most part are fairly disease resistant to this disease. Uh, this was an example on Bin Laman. This is our worst cultivar, most susceptible cultivar to the white pine blister rust particularly in Champaign. Um, there's a few other varieties in our trials that get the white pine blister rust, but it's, it's at you know, um, less than 1%, uh, arguably less than 0.1% coverage on the, on the foliage. So it's not quite a concern for most cultivars, uh, but some of these older releases like the Bin Lamond, um, you definitely wanna keep an eye out for and would not be recommended for, for production. Yeah, and I just wanted to talk for a second about this current spanworm here. So this is a um, caterpillar that can uh, really defoliate current plants. So this is kind of similar to what Eric was just mentioning um, with the, the cane dye back in that this was like a known problem um, in commercial current production way back before the currents were banned, you know, around the turn of 1900. Um, and I've seen it described in older literature that you can look up there, but when currents stopped being grown, this kind of all faded from view and now we're sort of rediscovering it to some extent. Um, but yeah, this is like a silk spinning caterpillar and it's really gregarious. You'll find um, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of these um, if you're not on top of them. And they can really do a tremendous amount of damage left uncontrolled, um, but they're super easy to control with, with BT. Um, you know, which is organic and, um, and really effective in conventional systems too, um, you know, as long as it's applied in a timely way. But it's something to, to keep an eye out for. And definitely one to keep up on top of because I feel like you leave them out there for a season and they, we, we first saw it maybe two years ago in our trials on a, one variety 
Well, now by this year, a couple of years later, it's, it's, they're, they're kind of everywhere. <laughs> so um, it is also unique. They, they tend to favor from what we've noticed more the red and white currents than over the black currents. And I, I believe it's something to do with the, if anyone's ever rubbed a black current, they stink. They have a uh, sessile glands in the bottom of the leaves that are very fragrant. And I think that's part of their uh, natural anti-pest control. Uh, so currants, though, they are a northern crop. In Europe, they're grown in, you know, Scandinavia, northwest Europe, through Russia, um, and central, central Europe. And so when we come into, particularly in Champaign, Illinois, and central Illinois here, we run into some issues with the um, environmental limitations. But we've noticed even some issues occasionally up in southern Wisconsin. Um, the main the main issue, you know, while early blooms, they do get damaged by low temperatures, um, they are fairly resilient. Um, and most of the cultivars do a good job of not uh, being as um, early leafing out or, you know, um, breaking bud. But the biggest issue is probably sunburn. Um, and you'll notice it with a sort of copper coloring on the leaves. And that starts to become an issue typically by July. We'll notice it here and in Wisconsin. Uh, when you get temperatures above 90 degrees, the leaves will start to kind of droop and flag. Irrigation can help with that, but at the same time, um, at the end of the day, they're just, they're just hot. So, um, and we have noticed, this was two years ago, uh, this was the 2020 season, we had a significant issue with high temperatures above 90 during harvest season in July. And so some of these currents, this was, a, I believe, a chica moose. Um, the, the fruit got scalded and it just softened up and it was like applesauce. I was, uh, kind of amazed and slightly disgusted by him and they don't actually ripen all the way. They, they, they'll start to mush and, uh, they'll turn into these soft, um, unharvestable berries. And the problem is, is that even the berries that are good in there, um, they all get mixed in. And so it really does ruin the crop across the whole plant. Um, and so there are some options. One, the nice thing is that particularly for the red and white currants, they tend to fruit earlier. And so they tend to miss that, that July heat that we get. Um, but some other options, especially for going into more of a processed market, is to use a product like Surround, which is a kaolin clay, uh, typically seen maybe in apples as a, as a way of producing the light penetration, sort of as a sunscreen. You see it a lot times more for like uh, insect control, but um, I think to reduce the sun uh, and, and actual light on them, that sort of sunscreen effect might actually be quite beneficial. So Eric, what's your thought on how much or if at all um, the black plastic landscape fabric exacerbates heat damage? I mean, without actually having done any replicated trials, I, I, I think it does have some effect on the, on the plants themselves. Um, you know, in Europe, they recommend using a wood mulch, particularly for the fact that it helps cool the soil. And um, so I think there might be an issue with that black plastic heating up the soil a little bit more. And so they just when they get in those hot periods, probably can't handle the, the heat stress as well. Um, but at the same time, I would say black plastic beats out uh, weed competition. And so it's sort of a trade off. Uh, do you want to have less vigorous growth or do you want to have sun scalded leaves? And uh, you know, at the end of the day, I would, I would, I would argue that the, the black mulch is probably still a better option <laughs> than nothing at all. And so I just want to go through a little bit on the harvesting aspect of the currents. Uh, so this is a machine harvester that we used for um, black current trials. These are um, black cone black currents uh, in the back of the truck bed. Uh, a Wareham Joanna three harvester. Um, and we've tried multiple different ways of harvesting. So I'll kind of go through and give just a sort of a brief overview of the benefits and setbacks of each. So the first method and the, the tried and true method is, is hand harvesting. Um, we probably, I would say the majority of our crops are hand harvested, partly due to the, the fact that we have to harvest by plant for research. Um, but also the cost is uh, a $5 umbrella and just some, some good old back labor. So overall, uh, harvesting represents about 60 to 7% of the total needs for production, um, particularly when it's hand harvested. But the nice thing is these berries do store well in the freezer if you want to process them later. Um, 
We say five to 10 pounds per bush expected yield. We have been well below that uh, on average, uh, but that's sort of the target goal in the literature uh, across Europe. And I'm not sure exactly if it's more on the spacing side. We, we keep our plants pretty, pretty narrow. But. So for hand harvesting, we calculated that roughly as around 170 billable hours per acre for hand harvest which is quite extensive. Um, typically this is, uh, we, we conduct on our, on our little over half acre trial. Um, we have on average three to four people for about two weeks straight harvesting currants uh, to make sure that everything comes in on time and, and ready. The currants do hold on for a little bit after maturing, but um, they, they do start to drop pretty quickly. And the, again, they'll start to soften up. So there's, there's a window there that you wanna hit Currants also don't necessarily ripen evenly. And so, you know, for some hand harvesting operations, it's recommended to harvest a, the same plant maybe twice or three times in a season. Um, but for us, one, for making it easier for research and two, just to make it easier for harvest, um, we tend to just harvest all at one date. So once the, the youngest of the berries become somewhat ripe and the oldest of the mature berries start to drop, that's usually when we start to go out and harvest the, the, the plants. And so as Chris mentioned, those red and white currants, uh, you harvest them as strigs. And so you kind of pull them off almost like you're harvesting a grape. Um, whereas the black currants, they form much smaller strigs, maybe three to five berries per strig. And so those ones, you kind of pop them off using your fingers as a, as a comb. And then it's really nice if you can drop them into an umbrella um, to actually catch them instead of having a hand grab each berry and put it into a harvest bag. And that was sort of a thing that we've we found works really well. Obviously the umbrellas aren't um, the greatest. They, we use nylon so we can actually kind of clean them and keep them somewhat sterile. But uh, if, if anyone out there is a fabricator and, and has some, some gumption, we'd love to see an umbrella method that's a little more professional looking uh, for, for, for production methods. Uh, next slide. So the one other thing that we've uh, trialed that's uh, I think in the more of the low budget side of things is uh, these pneumatic shakers. These are olive shakers that um, we ordered from, I believe California and I believe they're out of Italy. Um, these, we use a little air compressor on the back of our, uh, our little uh, garden tractor, little lawnmower and uh, use it to shake the, the berries. These work incredibly well for black currants. And for the red currants, they give you a little bit more control over a harvester um, to, to help, but we mainly have just been using this for red currants. Um, and so actually we'll pull, if you go to the next slide, that can hopefully show a little better. So you can see we pull the, the um, one of those little side catchment systems with the UTV and with that garden tractor. And since we already have the air compressor out there, we'll, we'll put the berries actually into a little kiddie pool and use the air compressor to blow out the leaves. And so we can actually do a pretty good job of cleaning uh, the material, um, especially because those shakers tend to drop a lot of leaves. Uh, so that's a really nice way of, of fairly quickly harvesting plants. And we've reduced our time, um, it was on the last slide there, but pretty, pretty significantly. Um, so that was a really nice option. We were able to manufacture these. We used uh, sheets of aluminum and just some basic riveting and some wind structures with uh, some, some caster wheels just to kind of bring them along through the field. And this overall is probably under $2,000 total. So a really nice way if you want to uh, greatly increase uh, your speed uh, and your, reduce your labor costs for harvesting, but you don't want to put in a whole lot of input costs. And I'll say one other thing that's sort of an advantage to these systems over, let's say, the, the big fancy harvester is if you are trying to grow uh, intercropping trees or other uh, plant materials, the really nice thing about this method is that you're going along either side individually. And so you could theoretically harvest between trees quite well um, using this method besides having a hand harvest. And so the last one is the machine harvester. Um, this one, it doesn't require as many people. We've actually harvested before with, with a minimum of two people, um, but typically about four people or so is, is ideal. Um, and this reduces labor costs significantly. Uh, we're down about 2.25 hours per acre using the team. Uh, roughly translates to about 6.75 billable hours per acre. And so we'll use this one for, 
we have a large 37 acre um, plot that has mixed crops. We have maybe um, five acres or so of actual currants and uh, we can harvest that whole site in, in a day, which is um, very nice. It goes really quite quickly um, and we're able to harvest thousands of pounds in a, in a single go. So when you get into the higher ends, I mean, that's definitely useful, but those machines are expensive. Um, and it can be kind of hard to justify if you have a smaller operation under, um, say, five acres, uh, particularly when you're only going to use it for one or two days out of the entire season. So it's something you need to justify or poten potentially if you find other current producers that would utilize that, it might be a good op opportunity for a sort of cooperative buy. I think there's one. There it is. The Joanna 3, it's a great machine. We, we've loved it. I, I believe where I'm checked, they're out of Poland. I believe they're on the Joanna 5 now. Um, this was a narrow series so we could tra trailer it and bring it around easier, um, but they have plenty of other options. Uh, the Joanna series can be used to harvest uh, currants, uh, aronia, many of your uh, kind of shrub crops, and uh, they're kind of expanding. So different headers can be put on um, those sort of shaker booms in the middle, depending on what crop you're using. So this would not work for trellis uh, plants, but it does work well for the nice hedgerow type tight, tight current spacing that we have and that we utilize at many of our sites. I mean, Eric, I mean, just to clarify, would you say that this is really only for like processing market currents? Well, so that's the thing. Honestly, we actually had quite a few people and we've, we've sold actually fresh market with uh, current harvest from the Joanna. It really depends on the current variety used. For the black comb, we've noticed that it has a nice thick flesh and it does great. I mean, you can be harvesting very nice, good looking berries. This has a squirrel cage fan that blows out the, the leaves and debris. So, I mean, it comes out and it's, you can almost just pop them in your mouth as they're coming out. Uh, other varieties like Tibbin, they're more of a, already a processing current to begin with. Uh, those ones tend to mush up a lot more. And so, you know, you're probably not gonna get as good of fresh market currents out of that. But yeah, surprisingly, um, some, of the, some of the black current varieties in particular uh, do quite well with this. Arguably, they say you can do Rovada <laughs> as a red current through these, um, but I would be yeah a little hesitant about selling those as a fresh market option. And would they be removed from the strigs then? Like if you pick Rovada with the machine harvester? That's I, don't, I have no idea. So I feel like the strigs would make it more difficult overall. But the Rovada, you know, some of those red currents do tend to pop from the strigs if shaken properly. So, you know, I, it all depends on the, I think the, the, the thickness of the skin and the readiness of the plants to actually drop the berries. And so those two factors are very dependent on each cultivar. And arguably, if you've hit the timing just right, we've, we've gone out in the field to harvest um, uh, a, a cultivar. We had the machine break down and we harvested a week late of some of our uh, blackcurrant varieties. And yeah, they, they were too far gone. They were mush, they were coming out completely busted. It was almost like putting out juice. And so um, there's a lot of factors that go into whether or not this machine will be effective for your operations or not. So I, um, in preparation for this, tried to talk to some other current growers in the region and, and get a sense on what different people were charging. And um, I think I found some fairly, fairly consistent prices. Um, so it seemed like conventional growers selling fresh fruit like a farmer's market or in a, in a store, you know, at the retail price is about $4 a pint. Um, organic growers are coming in a little higher, like $4 a half pint and five to $7 per pint. Um, so that's just something to, you know, keep in mind. Um, and I guess the, there, there was actually a sort of a marketing study done. I, this was a few years ago now in Wisconsin where a few growers got together and um, did some trials of different marketing techniques. And, and certainly they, I think the overall conclusion from what they did was that, you know, this people are unfamiliar with these berries and that you know, giving them recipes, serving suggestions is really key to convincing them to buy. Um, and the other thing that I heard from some other growers was, you know, finding consumers who are already familiar. And the example that uh, this other uh, farmer used was, the Eastern European immigrants in the Twin Cities area 
who were accustomed to you know using currants in their cuisine and were had trouble finding them in the U.S. So they were delighted to you know have a local source for them and were willing to you know buy in pretty large quantities. Um, so that's another way around the the problem of consumers not being familiar with them. And in my experience, they sell pretty poorly in grocery stores. You know, there's people that aren't familiar with them, and then the, the produce departments don't really give them the attention and you know promotion that they would give to blueberries or raspberries and so forth. Um, so it can definitely be a, a tough sell, you know, in the fresh fruit marketplace. I don't know, Eric, did you have anything you wanted to add about the kind of more wholesale processing level market? Yeah, I mean, so I guess just at a, a low level interview uh, overview there is just that, um, you know, well, wholesale, you definitely drop the prices. Um, but again, uh, we, we've noticed that, yeah, we, our sales maybe for, um, for, for the, for the pint level market is only a few hundred pounds a year. You know, we probably sell um, at most 500 pounds between the black currants, red currants and white currants in a, in a fresh market operation. Um, but we can, we sell thousands of pounds at the wholesale level. And so for wholesale markets, uh, those ones we tend to work with uh, jam and juice makers, um, as well as some of the local breweries and, and wineries will take the currants. But for the most part, they prefer a processed product, a, a puree. And we haven't been able to provide them that from a university standpoint. Uh, so most of our sales are, we're selling them whole berries and then they do the processing themselves. Um, or we help the, the brewers using a, a commercial kitchen or not even commercial kitchen, a, a you know home kitchen uh, uh, juicers and doing that for a couple hours to, to process through only about 200, 200 pounds of currants. So um, there are ways of getting around it, but um, yeah, for the most part, the wholesale prices drop down um, anywhere from 250 to $5 a pound uh, for black currants. So they, they go down quite a bit, but again, the, the changes in the overall climate quality of the fruit and for the overall target audience changes up quite a bit. Yeah, so I guess I, we probably should have said earlier for people who are really unfamiliar with these crops is that and the black currant differs pretty substantially from the red, white, pinks um, in flavor. It's got a really pretty strong, distinct flavor that I think a lot of people find kind of unpalatable in the fresh form, mm -hmm. but, but not necessarily everyone. Um, the red, whites, and pinks are, are tart, more or less, um, but lack that really strong flavor and aroma and all. Um, so I think they're, they're sort of a more neutral food item. I think, you know, more, a wider range of people will find them acceptable, I guess I would say. But it sounds like you're able to sell some black currants as fresh berries even. Yeah. So that's, you know, historically the black currants are a processed crop. Uh, and the red and white currants have always uh, traditionally been, you know, a, um, fresh eaten, or they put them into confectionery baked, baked good products. Um, so that's, that's uh, sort of that, that side of things. But um, yeah, the black currants, we have some new releases from uh, McGinnis berry crops up in British Columbia, uh, Canada. And so some of those ones, his, um, the, the breeder out of that program, his major goal was to find palatable black currants and to breed palatable black currants. And I would, I would argue that he did. Uh, a couple of the varieties such as Whistler and Tossus are readily available and uh, can be eaten fresh. I had, uh, my friend's kid ate an entire, I mean, a, a, a pint and a half probably of, of black currants I brought to a, a little barbecue and I was expecting my friends to eat them and nobody really touched them, but the, uh, my friend's kid ate the entire bowl at, in one sitting. So I, I do think the, the palatability has increased for some of those black currant varieties, but uh, certainly beat some of them you get kind of slapped in the face with that <laughs> sour muskiness that is uh uh certainly takes some time to get used to i'd say <laughs> yeah so i see that there's some couple of questions in the chat um one of them was uh with the pneumatic shaker work with the trellis system do you have thoughts on that eric i would be very concerned about rattling those trellis <laughs> <laughs> trellis is loose um you know when i when i was in the netherlands they had trellis systems but they were specifically for 
a hand harvested operation and a you pick operation. So, you know, I would I would argue that the the, the pneumatic shakers are more in the production um, um, processed current market kind of level, whereas the you know I think the trellising the nice thing is that they're all in a very readily available location to harvest. So um, I imagine the you'll find that the the hand harvesting time will go down quite a bit using trellising methods compared to it takes quite a while when they're all just open shrubs that are difficult to get through the canopy with. Yeah, I mean, my understanding in Europe is that, you know, yeah, trellising is for hand harvest and then freestanding bushes for machine harvest, but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, then there's a, there's a question of uh, uh, typical disease I see in my red currants is brown spots on the leaves, which appear to defoliate the bush suggestions on how to diagnose and treat. Um, I'm guessing that's leaf spot would be my guess. Yeah, like anthracnose or? Um, yeah, we, we have a hard time distinguishing yeah. the anthracnose from the sep septoria. Right. We treat them both kind of the same. Um, you, you mean, certainly here in Wisconsin, sending it to the plant disease diagnostic clinic is a great way to get it diagnosed. I don't know where the question is coming from, but a lot of states have disease diagnostic mm -hmm. labs. Um, do you have suggestions on treating either of those? We, well, for both the leaf spots, we tend to, we try to use like Serenade, which is a um, organic fungicide. It's a biofungicide. And that's worked um, fairly well. And we had pretty good control of it. Um, we definitely noticed that it's, it's way more prevalent on the red currants. And we tend to defoliate the bush early. But... <laughs> But that being said, uh, most of our currents, even if they don't get the leaf spot, the red and white currents tend to defoliate by August or September for the most part. They, they tend to like to, down near us, they, they like to drop their leaves pretty quickly. Yeah, here we, if I've seen leaf spot at all, it's a pretty late season disease on currents. We get it a lot on gooseberries actually, mm, mm -hmm. um, which are you know closely related, but certainly a different plan. And we've had some luck controlling on the, and on the gooseberries with uh, Cueva, which is like a low dose copper organic mm -hmm. little fungicide. Um, and also with Regalia, which is like a disease, a uh, resistance inducing product, um, but not really perfect control with either product by a long stretch. Yeah, I would say at the end of the day, cultivar selection is best. You know, the Revada, we don't really quite have issues with it. Um, we see it more in like Red Lake, some of the older cultivars. Um, that we start seeing, seeing the, the leaf spot, but it has been a target of, I think, more the a lot more of the recent breeding programs for the red and white currants in particular. And then there was another comment here from Scott, um, oh, a couple of comments about harvesters. I don't know if you mm -hmm. see these um, folks. Yeah, we, yeah. we used that, uh, that paper actually sort of as a reference point for our, our design. Uh, it was, it was sort of, uh, we were looking around and we were like, there has to be a better way of doing this. And it was a really neat paper to find that um, they did a, a nice kind of straddle harvester. Our concern was that we were mainly needing it to get between trees. And so that harvester listed um, has a hard metal uh, support to go in between either side of, the, of that sort of catchment system. And so that's why we kind of took out that middle, made them individual side things. And that way we could go through the, you know, around the trees with the currents. Um, and still harvest. But, you know, that's, I like the platform idea they have for there. Um, and their major goal is to reduce the, the, the stress to the bodies of, of people harvesting, which, you know, I think is a very important goal. <laughs> As somebody who is, uh, you know, usually by mid July, my back is about ready for a, one to two weeks on the couch in a, in a heat pack. So <laughs> it's always good to see people, you know, actually researching how to, how to keep people's bodies uh, healthy and and intact. Yep. But I think over time we'll start seeing more and more development in the sort of, um, I would say light mechanical options, you know, uh, like using those sort of handheld pneumatic shakers, the more budget options, um, particularly for the fact that, you know, most of these berry crops, I would say, is particularly here in the Midwest, uh, and particularly if you're not in, not in the fruit, fruit belt of Michigan there, um, I would say are, are usually on the smaller scale acreage, you know, uh, less than an acre up to maybe four acres. And so 
the the justification for a full fledged harvesting machine is just not quite there. And so you have sort of these in between methods that are a step up from hand harvesting, but well below the costs and the requirements that some of those heavy machinery harvesters are, are needed. Um, and so I think we'll start seeing more of that. I think we'll start seeing more development in sort of the handheld options, just ways to kind of um, speed that up past just, again, the simple tossing them in a little little uh, harvest bag um, uh, over time. And at least that's my hope. <laughs> I hope to contribute to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other, so someone says a number of comments. I was selling excess fresh currants as subcontractor through the West Dallas farmers market from my city backyard bushes planted in '87. Uh, in 2019, a lawn service treated my yard with AD, mistaking my address for my neighbors. In 2020, there were no berries on the bushes. Um, is that? I'm guessing that's 24D. We've we put 2,4-D and, and dicamba uh, in the early stages of our current trials uh, as a weed control option and it. Yeah, it, it kind of decimates the current crops. They don't, I would say they're the most, that's probably the most susceptible of the herbicides is, is a 2,4-D dicamba um, a product. So yeah, on the plus side, it, typically I'm guessing if you'll find a 2021, there probably should have been hopefully some renewed berries and hopefully by this season you'll have Good regrowth again if you can can keep the neighbors out of the, out of, the, out of your currents. Yeah, do folks so, have any other questions? We're nearly at the end of an hour. But. Well, we answer some more questions, and actually, I have a question. I would just want to launch a, a short little poll uh, for the audience while we wrap up the um, the webinar. And one of the things that I wanted to ask was about the development of markets for currents. And not only for currents, but I know that both of you are very much familiar with, with growing small fruits and, and berries such as gooseberries. And, and what do you think about what's going to happen in the future with trying to develop this market uh, in regions like you know, the Midwest that obviously doesn't include you know, big scale like Michigan? Chris, or I have comments. Um, I, mean, I, think it, I think there's definitely a, an avenue in from like the superfood kind of perspective, um, you know, especially in the process of you know, juices, things like that, um, or even as, you know, additions to, you know, bars and various foods and all. Um, I think it, in the fresh fruit market, it's a, definitely an uphill battle. Um, I feel like you need someone with a good marketing persona and you can really push the product well and then you can develop sort of a small local market but then someone else 100 miles away has kind of got to do all the work again um, you know to develop that same market in their area i don't know what you think eric yeah I, i'd agree with that it's it's been a very uphill battle and um, most of my talks go back to well how do we sell these plants <laughs> and uh, it's it's difficult um, it's, it's just not really necessarily a crop that we are used to in America. I mean, it was banned for most of the, you know, past century for developing markets. And so, um, but I know like organizations like the Savannah Institute, they had, and I helped them with a grant that was for um, figuring out the barriers to marketing black currants. It was particularly for black currants, but um, they, they were finding that through efforts of meeting with like sort of local um, uh, chefs and producers and, you know, uh, wine and, and beer and, and liquor makers, they found that they could actually kind of help drive the adoption. But again, that's at more of a wholesale level. Um, but yeah, their, their main findings were that we need to get more recipes out there. People need to just get more familiar with the crops themselves. And, you know, we found even at the university level that uh, we had quite a bit of people getting more interested in black currants when we put them into popsicles um, yeah. or making a juice. You know, people try and they're like, this is actually really good. And we're like, you know, we've been, <laughs> we've been saying that. But uh, so I think there's, a, there's definitely a wide opening there for um, just helping people to understand uh, how those crops can be used, how the black and white currants uh, and red currants can be utilized and, and recipes and just overall tasting events have been very effective at people being 
sort of opening their eyes to the potential of, of, of currents. There's a couple of comments there. It says, uh, Nanette said that I would market uh, using baked goods and was blessed with customers from Eastern Europe and England. Samples may not be an option at this point in time, but every year more customers look for me in early July. Then uh, Scott also says that for aronia juice, I use my apple grinder and blader press to squeeze the aronia for juice. Juice yields on par with what the aronia growers get with the press he uses. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say the, the and for black currants, red currants, I think work quite well. The, the black currants have a such a high pectin content. <laughs> it's great for jam makers. I mean, they can almost, you can almost just grind up a, a black currant, stick it in a jar and you'll have a, a pretty thick jam. Um, but the downside is I've tried using a, a grinder followed by a basket press and uh, the black currants just didn't go in. I mean, <laughs> you put five gallons in a, in a basket press and it, it didn't produce anything. So uh, we do find that freezing them ahead of time helps break them down. Uh, heated extractions help as well. If you did a, a grinder followed by a heating and then pressing them helps. Um, and then, yeah, using rice holes or, or peach pits or something like that can also help get a little bit more pressing out of it. But it's uh, our our uh, food science lab. We brought we brought currants there multiple times, and they they kind of hate us, I think, <laughs> because they're they're so difficult to extract. And, and the aronias are very messy. So when we bring them aronia berries, they they uh, get pretty mad because they spend more time cleaning than they do actually pressing the juice. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, some issues there. <laughs> All right, well, we are past uh, the hour and I really wanna thank you both Chris and Eric for an excellent uh, webinar, a lot of information and, and there's all this additional material there that you're sharing with us. If you're interested for the audience, if you're interested in um, our other series that we have, and we have one more webinar of the series to end the series on March 31st on Honeyberries and I'll just, put, I'll just drop the, the link here uh, if you want to register. And again, really thank you, Chris and Eric, for all the information that you share with us. I certainly learn a lot about the currents. Great. You're welcome. Yep. Thank you so much.